John 3.16. Let's look at that passage again. <clears throat> For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son that whoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. We're going to focus tonight for this last section, next half hour or so, just on that phrase, whoever believes. It is what's called a present articular participle or a substantival participle that's used to describe a person. But what's important about that is that it's in the present tense. And based on the fact that it's present tense, many people have interpreted, I would say even most, have misinterpreted that to mean that it is in reference to continual belief, that you must continue to believe in order to get eternal life. And thus it's a support text, they say, for the doctrine of the perseverance of the saints. And is that true? I think we'll see tonight again that is not true, and I'll show you why. And this is an important point to keep in mind when it comes to tenses with verbs. When you do your exegesis, we saw prepositions are important, certain nouns are important, but verbs are really important. And the potential for misinterpretation is huge. Now when it comes to verbs, <clears throat> remember, there's all this information packed into them. They are, um, con you can conjugate them and glean all this out of them, tense, mood, voice, person and number, we're not going to review that. And I want to, again, emphasize that we shouldn't think in two dimensions when it comes to verbs. We need to think in a broader sense, more spatially, in like three dimensions. Because when it comes to verbs, I should really put it on the full screen there. We need to think in terms of time, aspect, and action start. Do you remember what the difference is? I'm really glad we're reviewing this because I even need to go back and wrap my brain around this from time to time. So I know you guys do. Do verbs indicate time? Not inherently. But what if they're combined, what if tense is combined with the indicative mood? Then it normally does, right? With indicative mood, a tense speaks either past, present, or future. Normally you'll find future refers to the future, present refers to the present, and aorist and such refers to the past, imperfect, etc. But that's only with the indicative mood. So time is there. Now there's debate about that. Some grammarians say, well, technically no, and then they get all theoretical, and it's just like, yeah, well, practically 90% of the time the present is used for the present, so come on. And then there's aspect. Aspect is very important because it's, it's not telling you about the kind of action that's happening. It's telling you about the writer's presentation of the action. It's telling you where the photographer's standing when he's taking the picture. That's all it's saying. And some people misinterpret tense, mood, voice, and all of that to indicate the kind of action that's taking place. The primary point that is communicated by verbs is not time, like in English. It's not even kind of action. It's the aspect. Now that is very different from English. And so we have to put ourselves into a Greek way of thinking when we're studying the New Testament. Okay. So aspect is the author's perspective of the action, either internal or external viewpoint. And I'll expand on that in a minute. Action sart is the kind of action again. It could be momentary, it could be repetitive or iterative, it could be continuous without interruption, etc. Hey, yeah. Aspect was the one that you gave us the slide with the parade going by. Yeah. This one? <laughs> yeah. This is really helpful to think in these terms. Here's the difference when it comes to aspect. There's basically two aspects, two broad categories of aspect. Um, you could be at a parade and right on the curb watching the parade go right in front of you. You're in the action. The photographer or the writer who's presenting truth from scripture is either in the action, he's right there next to Jesus with the crowd all around describing what's happening, or he's removed. 
there's some sense of remoteness where he's due to time, due to physical distance perhaps even, he's reflecting back on the event, he's, he's zooming out. He's using the aorist tense, let's say, to describe something that was repetitive at the time, but now it's, he's removed from it, so he's using an aorist. And I'll show you an example of that. So that's external viewpoint, zooming out. Internal viewpoint is when you're in the event. And you could also keep in mind that there are, there's perfective aspect where it's perceiving an event that in summary, he's summarizing an event, like the whole parade from beginning to end. That's called perfective aspect. Now this is often confused with action sart, kind of action, but it's still a matter of aspect here. Whereas imperfective aspect is you're in the event and you're seeing the event unfold right in front of you. It's ongoing, but there could be points of action occurring as the film is rolling right in front of you. So don't mistake imperfective and perfective aspect for action sort. Very easy to do. And I, as you read literature, sometimes you'll hear commentators or authors using them incorrectly. Perfective and imperfective refer to aspect, not action sort. Now let's, I'll give you an example here to hopefully clarify this. Galatians 4.4, 4. the word born is aorist tense here, as you would expect. Born of a woman, born under the law. Point in time, summarizing Jesus' birth, versus the word reigned with Christ for a thousand years. Guess what? That's also aorist. But did the thousand year reign happen at a point in time? No, it happened over points of time. But the author is zooming out, using an external aspect Thus, he's using the aorist that way. So aorist does not mean point in time, per se. It means summary action. Could be from a very broad viewpoint. Could be right up close at the moment. But it's aspect, again, we're looking at primarily, not type of action. Robert? When you clarify aorist tense doesn't mean uh, completed and once for all, is that because in the past during preaching, pastor has said things like, and this is aorist, which means once and for all it's done. Is that why now you take pain to clarify that it doesn't always mean that because there was some confusion that slipped in? Or Historically, there's been confusion. Um, in the, about 1970, there was an article called The Abused Aorist by Frank Stagg where he said, here is example after example of preachers, theologians, commentators who make that kind of quick passing comment and it actually is not technically accurate. And over time, developed into a, a, a just a, an assumption that aorist means point in time. It does not. In fact, the older grammarians, some of them like A.T. Robertson, never really said that it did but they were taken wrong. So it became kind of an urban legend among preachers especially. Now, is it wrong to say in your preaching, and I, I do it sometimes, this is aorist. Aorist active indicative, it refers to a point in time. Now, am I going to get into all the different uses of the aorist and why I believe the aorist combined with the indicative makes it in that context point in time? No, I'm not. For the average person in the audience, I'm not going to spend 15 minutes going over all the other aspects that tie into that point of grammar. I'm just going to summarize it and throw that out there. So it would be wrong to say that. But if push came to shove, you should know that technically it doesn't always mean that. It doesn't mean it by itself. Just aorist indicative doesn't mean it's point in time. Because there's exceptions to that. Now, am I going... Forwards or backwards here? Forward. Am I moving forward? Okay, grammar. Uh, when it comes to the type of action, you do want to look at, you do want to parse the word, you do want to know, is this aorist? Is it imperative mood? Oftentimes you'll find aorist imperative, a command, is point in time. 
Rarely is the aorist imperative telling you to do something continuously. So it's not to say tense is a non-factor. It is a factor. But what's the greater factor is context and the inherent lexical meaning of a word, like the word born. Births occur at a point in time. That's why we get birth certificates. They're not an ongoing, lifelong process. Praise the Lord, ladies, right? Here's another example of the aorist um, in Romans uh, 5.14. Nevertheless, death reigned from Adam to Moses, again showing a span of time, just like in Revelation, where it referred to a thousand years. So the time of action is past. Perspective of the action is perfective. It's being summarized by the writer, Paul. And the kind of action is continuous. But why is the aorist used there? Not because he's saying it was a point in time, it obviously was ongoing, but because he's summarizing in his external perspective. You see the difference? And you should know this. Now, I would expect you to be kind of foggy and rusty on this, but you can always go back and, and say, okay, what were those three things again? Time, aspect, and action. Sorry, I need to keep those separate in my mind. Okay? Now, if you don't do that, I'll show you the consequences of this. Let's say you think that aspect is action, Sartre. What do you do when you look at the Gospels and you have a parallel passage describing Jesus? One uses aorist tense and the other uses present tense, and it's the same event. You're going to say, oh, the Gospels contain a contradiction. Because one describes him, Jesus, doing an action that was point in time, and the other one describes the action as continuous. You've got a contradiction between these two Gospels. No, you don't. You've just got two different perspectives of the same action. That's all. Here's an example of that. Matthew 4.1. Jesus was led by the Spirit into the wilderness to be tempted, aorist infinitive, by the devil. To be tempted by the devil. It's an aorist infinitive of perazzo. And then in Luke 4, 1 and 2, it says, Then Jesus, being filled with the Holy Spirit, returned from the Jordan and was led by the Spirit into the wilderness, being tempted... Here it's a participle, but it's a present participle. Being tempted 40 days by the devil. So one's present, one's aorist. And by the way, even verbal parts of speech, which infinitives and participles are, um, aspect comes into play. So that's why that's important there. Now, I'm going to zip through these because a lot of this is review. In fact, I'm just going to cruise through these. The present tense in form. Let's say you've got a word and it's in the present tense form. You need to keep in the back of your mind that it could be a historical present referring to a past event. It could be something happening at the very moment that we're in now, present, or it could be future. Present tense could be used for all three. That's why I told you before don't think time primarily when it comes to verb tenses in Greek. Think aspect. And then secondarily, kind of action and time of action. Okay? This is all repetition. You've had this before, and I'm going to zip through these. Same thing with aorist. Know that aorist, with the indicative, normally refers to a past event in terms of time, but it could also be referring to a present event called the dramatic aorist. Or it could be even used for a future event that hasn't happened yet, proleptic aorist. Here's the dramatic aorist, Luke 16, 4. I know what I shall do. You would not want to translate this where Jesus says, I knew what I shall do. Huh? Doesn't even make sense. But why is the aorist used there? It's used for dramatic effect. Romans 8.30, proleptic aorist. You know this passage well already. Glorified there is in the aorist, even though it's future, because it's a done deal. And God is, Paul is summarizing the process of our salvation in all three tenses as being complete in Christ. Participles. We want to get to this tonight because this is what John 3.16 is with the word believe. 
Participle is a verbal adjective. And what do I mean by that? I mean it combines the best elements of the verbs and the best elements of adjectives. Aren't you excited about this stuff? Yeah, it's got tense, it's got voice, it's got, it doesn't have mood. Participles are moodless. But they have gender, they have case, they have number, so they have these combinations of things, but technically there's no such thing as participial mood. Remember that? So when you parse it, you'll find the tense, present, past, a present, aorist, etc. <clears throat> It'll have voice, gender, case, number. And then there's two broad categories again that we want to think of regarding participles. They could be adverbial or they could be adjectival. Okay? Adverbial would be anarthrous. You can have them be temporal or they can be causal. Adjectival participles are normally broken down. They can be attributive and modify a noun or some other word, just like an adjective can. Or they could be substantival, and this is the one we're going to focus on now, where they function like a noun and are translated he who, or the one who, or those who, if it's plural. Okay? So John 3.16, we've arrived. <laughs> Notice the phrase, in order that pas, hina pas, in order that all who believe, ha pistuon. Notice you've got, I'm going to use uh, white here. This is, <clears throat> every time you've got a hina clause, you're going to have a verb in the subjunctive here may not perish, but have. These are subjunctive. I'm going to go over this first before we get to hapis duon, just to get this little one out of the way. Remember with subjunctive, we translate it may, might, etc., which could imply to our English minds, it's English idiom, or it's a Greek idiom, that you always have to have subjunctive after hina. Almost always. Okay? It's just like a rule almost of, of Greek. It doesn't necessarily mean that something is iffy. In fact, the NIV, do you realize they translate this? John 3.16, that whoever believes in him shall not perish. Is it wrong for them to do that? No, I don't think so. If the person has believed and fulfilled that condition, it is guaranteed they will not perish and have eternal life. Now, some have misinterpreted the subjunctive there as proof almost that just because you believe, you could still go to hell. And that's not what this grammar is indicating at all. Now, now let's go back to this substantival participle here, ha pistuon. Just because it is present tense, does that mean that it's referring to continuous, ongoing belief? Notice how John MacArthur interprets this. From his book, The Gospel According to Jesus, he says, but it is not a biblical view of faith to say that one may have it at the moment of salvation and never need to have it again. The continuing nature of saving faith is underscored by the use of the present tense of the Greek verb pistuo, believe, throughout the Gospel of John. By the way, the phrase hapistuon is used by John over and over again. It's his preferred way of, of referring to one who believes in Christ. And he gives you a bunch of verses here too. And it's used in Romans, as you can see, several times and other places, Acts. He goes on to say, if believing were a one-time act, the Greek tense in those verses would be aorist. <laughs> John, you just failed applied Greek. That is categorically not true. Now, another guy, James Roscup, who, by the way, teaches at Master's Seminary, has for years with John MacArthur, wrote an article on who the overcomer is. And the phrase hapistuon is grammatically identical to the phrase for he who overcomes in Revelation, ha nikon. They're both present articular substantival participles. Say that fast ten times. <clears throat> but here's what he has to say. 
He has a very famous article that's out there on the internet. A lot of people refer to it as proof for the overcoming or being one, the overcomer being one who practically overcomes and is positionally both an overcomer. But he says, 1 John 5.5, 5, where it defines he who overcomes, by, it's by faith. 1 John 5.5 5 goes on to utilize present tenses, quite plausibly customary or iterative presents to denote the general overall pattern of overcoming for the Christian who believes in an ongoing sense, 1 John 5.1, bestuo, present tense, that Jesus is the Son of God. Later in Revelation 2-3, through 3, he who overcomes is virtually the same as he who believes. John also uses the present tense of nikao, I overcome, in Revelation 2 through 3, suggesting that continuing victory is characteristic of the saved, just as continuing faith is. <coughs> Wrong again. I'm going to give you several examples here. And uh, you don't have to write all these down. In fact, if you get the book, Should Christians Fear Outer Darkness, turn to the Overcomer chapter at the end, which I wrote, and you'll see all this information there. So save yourself the work. But I think these examples are, and I just picked a few. I did a, a search on uh, Bible works where I typed in the right codes and did a search on it, and shazam, I got like a hundred of these possi possible uh, references for this exact present substantival articular participle construction that does not refer to ongoing activity. Here's just a few. Matthew 2, 19 and 20. When Herod was dead, behold, an angel of the Lord appeared in a dream to Joseph in Egypt, saying, Arise, take the young child and his mother, and go to the land of Israel. For those who seek the young child's life are dead. Present tense. Huh? Now, if it means ongoing action, how can that be? They're dead. They're seeking him, but they're dead? That doesn't make any sense at all. It's the exact same grammatical construction as Hoppus do own in John 3.16. By the way, when it comes to uh, Hoppus do own and that grammatical construction, it's kind of like saying that somebody is a murderer if they've murdered one time. The murderer is a description of somebody. doesn't mean they're committing ongoing murder, it could mean they've done it one time. Or the benefactor, if you gave one huge gift to, let's say, the university and they remember you thereafter, you're a benefactor. Does it mean you continue to give? No. It's just a description of you. And the same is true when it comes to somebody who believes. You could believe one time and you're a believer. And these verses prove it. Here's another one that's kind of comical. Matthew 5, 31 and 32. Furthermore, it's been said, whoever divorces his wife, let him give her a certificate of divorce. And it's a aorist subjunctive there, I believe. But I say to you that whoever divorces his wife, present articular participle, for any reason except sexual immorality, etc., you know the verse. So here you've got the same person being referred to, the one who divorces his wife. One uses the heiress, the other uses the present. But it's the same person that's being referred to. It's just remember, aspect again. Jesus can prefer to speak of it one way in one verse and another way in another verse, and there's no contradiction. But for those who insist, well, heiress means point in time, and present means continuous, what do you do with a passage like this? We're back to back, same person, two different tenses. Matthew 27, 1 through 3. Um, when morning came, all the chief priests and elders of the people plotted against Jesus to put him to death. And when they had bound him, they led him away and delivered him to Pontius Pilate, the governor. Then Judas, his betrayer, seeing that he had been condemned, was remorseful and brought back the 30 pieces of silver to the chief priests and elders. The betrayer is present tense. Now at this point in the life of Jesus, Judas and Jesus, was Judas continuing to betray Jesus? No, he had already done it. His act of betrayal was fulfilled. That's why he had the money in his hand. 
they had sent him on his way with the bag of money. And he saw it and was remorseful. But notice he's called the betrayer even after the fact. He did it once. And here's another example of that. Matthew, Mark chapter 5, verses 15 and 16. Then they came to Jesus and saw the one who had been demon-possessed, present participle. But notice it's translated as though it's in the past tense for the reader. And had the legion, sitting clothed in his right mind, etc., they were afraid. And those who saw it told them how it happened to him who had been demon-possessed. Same thing. Present articular participles. But it's translated with the past tense to make it clear for the English reader. Really, it's present tense. But it's past, it's after the fact, but they're you're still using the present tense to describe these individuals. I, I find this one to be funny too. Mark 6, 14. Now King Herod heard of him, for his name had become well known, that's Jesus. And he said, John the Baptist is risen from the dead. Therefore, these powers are at work in him, in Jesus. Remember, Herod mistook G uh, Jesus as John the Baptist come back from the dead. So John the Baptist is dead at this point, but how is he described? As John the baptizing one, present articular participle. Now, is he baptizing in the afterlife? Obviously, it can't mean ongoing, right? So you, you get the point here. I'll give you a couple more. John one twenty nine. The next day, John saw Jesus coming toward him and said, Behold, the Lamb of God, who presently takes away, continuously is taking away the sin of the world. Now, this is in John chapter 1. Eighteen chapters before he goes to the cross. He's not going to take away the sin of the world yet in chapter 1. But how is he described? In a proleptic sense, as the one who will take away the sin of the world. But because he will do it, <clears throat> he's described as the one who does take away the sin of the world, present tense. Again, this construction is just a title for someone who could do something repetitively, like baptizing, could do something one time, like die, or anything in between. And it's the same construction as John 3.16. Same thing here, <clears throat> where it refers to Jesus as the one who baptizes with the Holy Spirit. Obviously, in chapter 1, Jesus is not baptizing people with the Holy Spirit yet. He hasn't died, he hasn't been resurrected, he hasn't ascended. It's not Acts chapter 2 yet. But the present tense is used here to describe him as the one who will do that activity. Likewise, John 11, 25 through 27, you've got hapistu on there, he who believes in me. And then at the end, uh, verse 27, um, um, the phrase is used to describe Jesus as the one who is to come into the world. Well, he already came into the world. He's standing right in front of uh, Martha, I believe. Ha erkamas. And so you can see these are parallel grammatically to he who believes. So you could believe one time and be and fulfill that description of one who believes. You don't have to believe in a continuous ongoing sense. The tense does not tell you that at all. In fact, if you press that, it leads to absolute absurdity with all these other passages. And that was just a brief sampling of many. I'll tell you another funny one. This is just kind of ironic. Romans 3.22. <clears throat> now, there was a guy who used to be in Gibbs here. You probably know who I'm talking about. He left Gibbs and left the church, and within two years, he embraced, um, I think, baptismal regeneration, and he clearly repudiates eternal security. And he has gone on the Internet and written reviews of pastor's books, Salvation in Three Time Zones, his water baptism booklet, um, Shall Never Perish Forever, etc. And he uses as his um, 
name, his internet name, because he wants to remain anonymous, uh, he uses Romans 3.22. Because one of his constant drumbeats is the present tense used for believe throughout the New Testament proves that you have to continue to believe and disproves eternal security. And guess what we have in Romans 3.22? We have a present articular participle, substantival participle construction that is exactly grammatically equivalent to all these other verses we just looked at. To all who believe, literally to the believing ones, it's plural. Does that necessarily tell you that it's ongoing belief? Not at all. Not at all. And it's a shame because you can't tell this guy uh, all these examples. He will not hear them. In fact, he's been presented with a few of them and he just categorically brushes them off. You can't reason with someone who rejects grace that way and is not of a humble mindset. The facts don't mean anything to him. But I do find it ironic. Because of the substantival use, is it, is it fair to say that something is ongoing, but it's, the, but it's their identity as a believing one that's ongoing, not necessarily their action of believing? Right. It's, uh, their, the descriptive title is ongoing for them. Yeah, okay. The action that gave them the title is not. It seemed like a lot of, maybe, <clears throat> maybe all but one of the examples that you gave us were referring to someone uh, um, who, whose title was an ongoing believing one or whatever. Or not ongoing, but, yeah. you know, like what you're giving us After here. After the fact, those, those who were demon-possessed, yeah. but really weren't anymore. But their, you know. their title goes on with them. They're known as that. Yep. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. It's kind of like the word saint. What did it take for you to become a... a a hagias, a holy one. All it took for you to, was the Holy Spirit to take you one time and put you in Jesus Christ. And you were constituted a sanctified one, a saint. But do you live saintly thereafter? <laughs> Speak for yourself. <laughs> uh, sometimes, sometimes not sometimes rather unsaintly. So it's the same thing. And hagias is, is uh, related to the verb, hagiazo, to sanctify or set apart. So saints are those who have been set apart, the same concept. And I won't go into it, but Sunday's message, uh, Dave had a reference to Hebrews 10.14, those who are being sanctified, same idea. So that's something to keep in mind, that present articular participle construction. You see it a lot throughout the New Testament. Don't misinterpret it to mean, ah, present tense participle must be ongoing action. Uh-uh, hold on here. Not necessarily. So, any questions on that? Okay, let's uh, pray and we'll call it a night.